Hi, this is Kane Hodder, better known as Jason from Friday the 13th, Victor Crowley from Hatchet. I've also played BTK, Ed Gein. Let's just say I've murdered a lot of people. In fact, I've murdered more people on film than any actor in history. So just keep that in mind. You are listening to the 80s Slasher Librarian. Keep listening, or I'll kill you. Friday the 13th, Part 5, A New Beginning. A fan novel by Landon Turner. Prologue. (laughs) Trauma can leave an imprint on you. It can follow you long after the trauma has happened, in ways that many people aren't aware of. Most people distract themselves in a myriad of ways. They get wasted or numb out on pain pills or by smoking. They chew their nails to the nub and become raging control freaks. Some behave like absolute narcissists and wreck the lives of everyone they touch. For some brave souls, they face it. Survivors of trauma can always remember the dreams. Sometimes they happen when you're awake. Everything is fine one moment, and then you realize all of a sudden that you're seeing it all happen again in your head. Fractured memories of screaming, blood, and carnage could all come back just with that faint smell of cigarette smoke in the air. The slam of a door. One small change in the environment can send you into a flashback. It can all feel so real as if it were happening all over again. Sometimes, 17-year-old Tommy Jarvis could still smell the metallic odor of blood in the air. Sometimes he could picture himself in an out-of-body experience, imagining himself hacking away at a person with a machete until their scream stopped or strangling the life out of some innocent bystander. He could feel the bloodlust rising within him, seconds away from erupting out of his chest and out into the world. Nothing he could do to stop it. It was a dark cloud, a force, a feeling so intense it consumed him. The doctors called it manic depression, PTSD, and disassociative disorder. Tommy had begun to believe it was just who he was, some outcast in the dredge of society, too mentally fucked to function. He was turning into the monster who did this to him, and he felt as if every day he was getting closer and closer to going stark, raving mad. Or maybe it was the curse of Crystal Lake. He would be sitting on his bed in his room all alone, staring at his collection of monster masks he had designed himself. They were the one thing that helped him stay sane most of the time. It was something to lose himself in and escape from the unbearable reality he was forced to endure. He would be engrossed in them, having visions of what it would look like on screen sitting on a prop table at some big movie set in California, only to have it tarnished by visions of steel blades piercing through flesh and sounds of screaming, the kind of screaming that had torn out of his throat seemingly from nowhere back when it had happened. He didn't want to feel these things anymore. He was tired all the time from sleepless nights of tossing and turning. He wished he could have gone back in time and begged his mother to take them back to the city, away from that godforsaken place. Tommy had had a quasi-normal childhood, despite his parents' divorce, and had a potential of growing up to be something big one day, full of dreams of finally putting his skills to good use and bringing entertainment to the world. It had all been snuffed out in one night, One horrible night back in 1984 when it all happened. Back at Crystal Lake, where a maniacal evil had descended upon his childhood home. 
It was a tale of pure terror, something that Tommy's young mind could never have even fathomed. Five years had passed since it had happened. Five long years of therapy sessions and mental institutions, and weekends of getting high with strangers, or blackout drunk to escape these visions. Five grueling years of hospital visits for getting in fights with kids at the many city schools he was sent to in Chicago. Some punk would saunter over to him at the lunch table and whisper, Mommy's in heaven. And the next thing Tommy knew, he was pounding the kid's head on the table and couldn't remember doing it. All he could see at the time was red. That was the one that got him sent away. The one that got him kicked out of school the first time. He felt like everyone blamed him instead of the monster who had turned him into one. But he's dead, Tommy, they all would say. The person who did this to you is dead. Don't you understand? He is alive inside my mind, Tommy would always tell them. And he was, every single day of his life after it had happened. Alive in his mind, in his thoughts, in his soul. Those demented eyes were all he could see. The last thing he saw before he had to fight for his life. When he had picked up the machete and hacked the monster to death, he had blacked out then too. His eyes had totally missed it over, and something had just come over him and overtaken him. He just wanted the monster to die. But now, he was seeing everyone as monsters, even after his monster was dead and gone. They all hated him and judged him. He would picture them saying, Get a grip, Tommy. He's dead. Get over it. Sometimes he wanted to hurt them. His sister, his father, kids at school, anyone who triggered something inside him. That small part of him with a hair trigger defense mechanism. Rage. Unstoppable rage. Nothing his therapist and doctors had told him had helped. Meditation just brought more images and memories back. Hypnotism didn't work either. The meds turned him into a lifeless shell of a person. Through it all, he kept thinking of his older sister Trish and his mother to pull himself back into reality. Trish had saved and protected him when it had happened, and he was lucky she was alive. The monster had nearly murdered her in a vicious rage. His mother had met a similar fate, except the monster succeeded, taking her from the world in the blink of an eye. Gratitude wasn't enough. Positive thinking wasn't enough. Whenever he closed his eyes, he could still hear Trish's terrified screams of terror ringing in his ears, begging the monster to stop. He could still picture his mother's last moments with the monster. And then once the blackout started, Tommy felt hopeless. It was like he had some dark cloud over his head since it had happened, and had attracted misfortune after misfortune after another, and he was getting nowhere fast. He was losing control. And then... His med stopped working and he was plunged back into a living hell. The dreams were almost every night now. Dreams that sent his body into throes of terror and cold sweats. He was plunged forcibly into one now. This time he was back at Crystal Lake, again, at his childhood lakefront home where it had happened. Everything was pitch black and hazy, like he was walking through a cloud of black smoke, and then he was enveloped in foliage. Tommy pushed aside the branches and took a look around. He was deep in the wilderness in the dead of night. Thunder crashed over his head. He looked down at the yellow raincoat he was wearing from his childhood, the same one his mother had always made sure he was wearing when it rained, back when she was alive. The storm was now deafening, and rain pelted him like bullets. Tommy moved underneath a huge pine tree taking shelter from the storm and trying to gain his bearings. He wiped the rain from his big wire-rimmed glasses. His mind screamed at him to wake up, but he couldn't. He was now being forced to look upon whatever his deranged mind would conjure up. With Tommy's imaginative and creative mind, his dreams were always a little too vivid and surreal. Wake up, he muttered to himself. He heard his own high-pitched prepubescent voice urging himself and realized he was a young lad again. Oh God, he thought. He was reliving it all over again. And then noises around him started cutting through the sound of the storm, and he jerked his head towards the tree line. Guided by seemingly some unseen force, Tommy reluctantly went the other way and trekked off into the dense woods surrounding him on all sides. Now he was being taken wherever his mind wanted to. He moved aside the wet branches, 
his galoshes that his mother had also bought for him sinking into the thick black mud up past his ankles. Thunder crashed again. and he could see the lightning flash above the canopy of pine trees that towered above him. He could barely make out his hands in front of his face through the sheets of rain that seemed to be able to make it through the canopy. But he kept moving, and moving. The woods seemed endless and time felt slow and sluggish. It felt like an eternity even though he had only been asleep for thirty minutes or so. Finally, the trees cleared and he froze at the side of where he found himself. He was at the open gate of the Crystal Lake Cemetery. Wake up! Wake the fuck up! His mind urged him. But as if he were being pulled by an invisible string, Tommy marched on into the cemetery. The tall pine trees that scattered the graveyard whipped around in the wind, and long skinny bolts of lightning reminiscent of gnarled bony fingers flashed across the sky. They were streaks of white incandescent light that illuminated the path ahead of little Tommy Jarvis. A thin white fog weaved in and out the tombstones and between the slats of the rusted, overgrown iron fence that surrounded the perimeter. The obelisk and tombstones seemed to tower above him, surrounding him. They were marks of death all around him. He kept marching on. What was his mind leading him to, he kept wondering. He didn't want to find out, but it was inevitable that his mind would force him to look upon it. The rain came down even harder, whipping at him. He didn't feel a thing. He was a boy on a mission, weaving in and out, determinedly through the maze of graves. Finally, he stopped at a small clearing at a small, isolated section at the back of the cemetery. Tommy froze with terror as he saw the name written on the shoddy wooden tombstone in front of him. Jason Voorhees. He couldn't tear his eyes away from it. It was the name that had haunted him for so long. It was the name of the monster. His monster. The one who plagued his nightmares. The one who stole his childhood and his adolescence. Then the sound of his own voice came to him, seemingly by the wind, screaming, Die! 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 It ricocheted off the inner walls of his mind, pounding at him, until he closed his eyes so tightly he thought they would burst. It wouldn't stop. He opened his eyes again. They were once again locked on the monster's grave. God, please make it stop, he thought. He tried to cover his ears with his hands, but he couldn't move. He just stood and stared in horror at the dirt where his monster was lying a few feet beneath. Die! 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 Those words were what he had screamed over and over again back during that summer at Crystal Lake. They always came back to him, throbbing, pulsating, ringing in his ears. All of a sudden, another voice, an unfamiliar voice, came to him through the storm. He's got to be around here somewhere, the voice said. Then another unfamiliar voice rang out. I don't know about this man. Tommy ducked behind a tombstone, moving out of sight of the two men that were carrying shovels as they were coming through the rain and fog towards the grave of the mass murderer. As they got closer, he scurried back into the woods just at the tree line and bent down to get a better look. Grave robbers, he thought. Oh, shit. The tall blonde man in a camouflage bucket hat, a gray parka and rain boots, turned to his slender, dark-haired partner in crime. You know how much money this could make us? He said. This guy's one of the most famous serial killers of all time. The blonde man nudged him with the handle of the shovel in his hand. The dark-haired man looked on nervously the glowing lantern rattling in his hand. We gotta keep looking, he's gotta be here. They weaved in and out and between the tombstones, searching for the monster. I know he's here somewhere, they continued on, shining the lanterns on the face of the tombstones, searching for the one they were after. Tommy stayed, shrunk down in the undergrowth, watching, his heart racing. The two grave robbers suddenly stopped in their tracks when they saw the wooden grave marker jutting out of the dirt underneath a tree. Look over here! One of the men exclaimed, pointing. There it was, the grave of the mass murderer Jason Voorhees, placed away from the other graves as if he were an outcast. This is it, the blonde man said, as the lantern illuminated the scrawled letters on the wooden plank. Let's get a look at the main man. 
they set their lanterns down and started digging fervently with the shovels, tossing dirt all around haphazardly, laughing and whooping excitedly. Come on, dig faster! I'm trying! Tommy bit his lip in anticipation, not wanting to watch, but forced to watch by his mind. He wanted to run, but his body would not let him. The grave robbers hit wood with their shovels and looked at each other. This is it! Come on! Get all the dirt off! The blonde man urged as they both hurriedly brushed dirt off the rickety wooden door of the coffin. There it was, only a few feet deep, and Jason's body was inside. Tommy couldn't believe what he was seeing. His eyes were transfixed on the open grave. The two thieves grabbed each other's shoulders with glee, laughing exuberantly. This is it! Woohoo! This is it! The other one shouted, finally losing his nervous twitch and gaining a surge of ecstasy. Slowly and with anticipation, the two robbers bent down and heaved the wooden lid off of the coffin. They slowly rose erect, staring down in a mix of fear and fascination, their eyes wide, their mouths ajar. Tommy was glad he didn't have to see what was inside. And then the unbelievable happened. A rotting, meaty arm suddenly flashed out from the open grave. Lightning flashed and the machete that the arm was carrying gleamed in the split second of intensely bright light. The blade plunged into the blonde man's stomach and he doubled over, coughing up blood. Tommy's jaw dropped. His eyes were as wide as saucers. He wiped his glasses again to make sure he saw what he thought he saw. And then with another flash of lightning and a clap of thunder, Another hand shot out of the grave. This time it held a rusted screwdriver. It plunged it into the other grave robber's throat. The two men never knew what hit them. Both men collapsed to the ground. The dark-haired man fell, grasping and clawing at the handle of the screwdriver that protruded from his Adam's apple, choking on the blood that frothed at his lips. His partner was dead on his back, his blood and his life draining away the machete sticking up into the sky like many of the tombstones around him. Both of them finally lay and stopped squirming as Tommy watched, paralyzed with nauseating terror. The machete and screwdriver were like gravestones atop the two dead men. Lightning flashed again and Tommy winced. Then, a gigantic dark shadowy form rose from the grave and up into Tommy's field of vision. His jaw dropped again and his whole body began to quake. It was Jason Voorhees. The hulking killer was back from the dead, illuminated again by lightning. <laughs> Maggots had eaten out his eyes, and two empty soulless pits of black stared back at Tommy through the eye holes of the hockey mask that the mass murderer wore to hide his grotesque appearance. His tattered work suit was covered in dirt, and pieces of flesh that had begun to rot were exposed. Jason lumbered out of the grave and stood to his feet. He was likely a whole three foot taller than Tommy, a giant beast of a man. The only thing worse than his appearance was the fact that he had his eyes, or lack thereof, directed straight at Tommy, and pulling the machete out of the slaughtered grave robber, he advanced through the rain. Tommy couldn't move, he couldn't scream, he shook his head. No, no, he muttered, barely audible through the howling storm. But Jason kept coming, brandishing the bloodstained machete that gleamed in the moonlight. No, no, Tommy's voice grew louder and more frightened as Jason closed the gap between them. Tommy still couldn't move, he was paralyzed in a trance. Jason kept coming. He stepped right in front of Tommy and stared down at him menacingly. Tommy let out one final shriek as Jason raised the machete into the air and brought it down in a single swoop. No! Tommy felt it slice into him. It cut deep. He felt the excruciating pain that was like getting shot by a thousand bullets at once. And then everything went black.
Okay, Slashaholics, this has been the prologue of the fan novelization of Friday the 13th Part 5, A New Beginning by Landon Turner. Landon, thank you so much for writing these. I'm really look for, looking forward to finishing this one and reading and narrating Part 7 that you're writing. And a lot of us hope that you'll do 8. You'll do Jason Goes to Hell. Hell, maybe some Halloween ones like Halloween 5, 6, 7, and on, you know. You can skip Resurrection, I think. I don't know. We'll have to check with everybody. Kidding. Kidding. But uh, there are a lot of requests for this sort of thing. I've had a lot of people ask if anybody would be up for writing a Child's Play 1 novelization or a Bride of Chucky novelization. So if anybody's up for that, I will definitely narrate it here on the channel. And Landon, your work has always got a place here. I really, really enjoyed the prologue of this book. I'm looking forward to narrating the rest of it. I'm going to alternate between this book and finishing Freddy vs. Ash. We've got a lot of cool stuff planned. Narrations are going to ramp back up the best I can. It's been slow for a while because of my health problems, but I'm really excited to be back in the saddle, and things are looking really good. I'm not going to go into too much detail, uh, but I've been seeing a doctor and getting a certain treatment, and it looks like I might come out of this thing completely 100%, or as close to 100% as I was before I got sick. Um, I'm really enjoying getting into Tommy's head, getting that prologue uh, from the movie, more detail and everything was so good, Landon. Really, really good. Please, everybody, be sure to thank Landon for writing these books because without them, we wouldn't have the, the audiobooks of Part 4. You know, he did, he wrote Part 4 that I narrated, and it was freaking amazing. We're going to be talking about that on the next Out of Print Slashers podcast, by the way. Um, also, little thing I've always thought about with this movie and the book. See if any of y'all agree with me. Could Tommy be a little bit psychic? Maybe the dream he had here in the prologue of the book and what he dreamt in the movie, could that be like a pro, like a premonition of what he's going to do in the future? Because even though it's not him that he was seeing, unless maybe it was him that he was seeing in the movie and in the book here. You know, maybe it was an older version of him and he just didn't know. Um, anyways, it's so close to what he does in uh, Friday the 13th Part 6, Resurrecting Jason, I just always wondered if maybe the writers of those two movies, I know they weren't really connected and stuff as far as the writers were concerned, very loosely from you know story to story, but what if that was a premonition that Tommy was having of what he was going to mess up and do just a few short years later after the events of Part 5? Food for thought. Uh, but I'm curious to see where Landon's going to take this, if we're going to get into Tommy's head even more. Uh, because he didn't really talk that much in the movie, but it looked like a lot was going on in there. And you did such a good job, Landon, of describing the trauma and the PTSD. I think we've all had at least one experience in our life, maybe not as rough as Tommy had it, but something that still sticks with us, sticks with us through all the years. I know I've got a couple of those things, and the PTSD is real, you know. So, uh, a couple things that I'm excited about. I want to see if we can, if the, if you're gonna if Landon's going to delve more into uh, the Roy Burns character and his son. Uh, hope I didn't spoil that for anybody, anybody that's not seen the movie that came out like 40 years ago. Um, I'm also curious to see if uh, any of the characters are going to suspect Tommy as a killer more, because I really, as a kid, I thought it was Tommy. I thought we were going to find out at the end it was Tommy, because uh, somebody had told me it wasn't Jason before I watched it, a friend at school. So, uh, yeah, I want to see if anybody's going to suspect Tommy more, or if that's going to get brought up. And there's some great characters in this movie, and I'm hoping that we get more into their head as well. And uh, a couple of the kills that got cut from the movie, I'm curious to see if Landon's going to throw those in. But even if not, it is so entertaining. Just the prologue was so much fun to get through. I cannot wait to see what comes next. Please let me know in the comment section, everybody, what you thought of the prologue. Uh, throw some thanks at Landon because he's working hard on these fan novelizations for us all to enjoy. And I'll be back very soon with more of Friday the 13th Part 5, the fan novelization by Landon Turner. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood slasher librarian saying thanks for listening, be excellent to each other, and we'll see you soon.